Good evening. Thank you for joining us for the panel discussion, the significance of the coyote to this land and its peoples. On the occasion of the exhibition, Dwayne Slick, the coyote makes the sunset better here at the Aldrich Museum. Uh, I apologize for any inconvenience that was caused by us having to move the panel from last Thursday uh, night until this evening. The Aldrich Contemporary Art Museum acknowledges that it rests on the ancestral homeland of the Wappinger and Muncie Lenape peoples. While these nations are no longer located on their homelands, the Aldrich is determined to make sure that their history and stewardship of this land is not lost. This acknowledgement is but a first step in righting wrongs and bringing awareness to the histories of these nations. I want to start by introducing our panelists this evening. Um, Dwayne Slick was born in 1961 in Waterloo, Waterloo, Iowa, and since 1995 has been professor of painting and printmaking at the Rhode Island School of Design, Providence, Rhode Island. Slick received a BFA from the University of Northern Iowa, Cedar Falls, and an MFA from the University of California, Davis, in Davis, California. Duane has exhibited widely and received numerous grants and fellowships, and his work is in the collection of the National Museum of the American Indian, Smithsonian Institution, Washington, DC, the Decorative Museum and Sculpture Garden, Lincoln, Massachusetts, among others. His heritage is Ho-Chunk, Nebraska on his mother's side and Meswaki, Fox of Iowa on his father's. Dr. Culture Rising Baldy is an associate professor and department chair of Native American Studies at Humboldt State University in California. She is the co-director of the NAS Food Sovereignty Lab and Cultural Workshop Space. She is the author of We Are Dancing For You, Native Feminisms and the Revitalization of Women's Coming of Age Ceremonies, which received the best first book in Native American and Indigenous Studies at the 2019 Native American Indigenous Studies Association Conference. She is also volunteer executive director of the Women's Native Women's Collective, a nonprofit organization that supports the continued revitalization of Native American arts and culture. She is Hoopa, Karak, and Yurok, and is enrolled in the Hoopa Valley Tribe. Dr. Jonathan Way has a BS from UMass Amherst and, Emma, and an MS from U University of Connecticut and a doctorate from Boston College related to the study of the Eastern Coyote Koi Wolves. He's the author of numerous books, including Suburban Howls, an account of his experience studying the Eastern Coyote in M Massachusetts and Koi Wolf, Eastern Coyote Genetics, Ecology, Management and Politics, which is a 280 page pictorial treatise on the two decades of research. John is the founder of the Eastern Coyote Koi Wolf Research uh, Organization and uh, is dedicated to conducting long-term ecological and behavioral research on Eastern Coyotes. He also supplements his research with regular trips to the West, including Yellowstone National Park and other national parks. Um, I'm gonna start this evening with each panelist briefly uh, speaking about their interest and background in this subject. Um, is Dr. Baldy with us? No. Uh, well, let's go to Dr. Wei. Uh, Dr. Wei, do you want to talk a little bit about your interest in the subject matter and how you got engaged with it? Absolutely. Hello. I think I can turn my video on now. <laughs> um, yeah, I've I've uh, always been interested in animals and wildlife. I'm from the Northeast. I'm from uh, Cape Cod, Massachusetts, uh, and I still live there right now. And um, and my background had always been interested in, I had always wanted to, to study wildlife and, and I had always had a specific interest in predators. And as I was going through high school and getting into college, Eastern coyotes started colonizing Cape Cod. And that fascinated me because there wasn't much known about them. Uh, there wasn't no, much known about their ecology, their background, really what the animals were besides you know, a coyote-like animal. Um, so my interest is, had always been kind of twofold with these animals. Number one, wildlife in general and predators specifically. And then number two, these animals kind of reaching the literal shores of where I lived when I kind of became aware of them. Um, and so my kind of career has taken a path where I originally wanted to maybe go to Africa or Yellowstone or some kind of far off exotic place to study uh, carnivores or wildlife in those areas. And then I realized because there wasn't much known about the animals living literally where I live, um, that it would be kind of cool to study them and find out their ecology, their behavior, and essentially what they do around us, which, which we'll get to later. Um, and that has kind of morphed 20 years later, 25 years later, into kind of a 
full-time gig of, of, of investigating these animals and learning about them and, and publishing about them. Um, and it all kind of stemmed from them being near me and my fascination with wildlife, which I was fortunate to be able to pursue through my academic studies, studies excuse me, through college and, and graduate school. Is uh, Dr. Baldy with us? Um, Dwayne, uh, I guess we'll go. Uh, Dr. Baldy's having internet problems, the universal trouble of our time. Uh, I guess we'll go to Dwayne to talk. About, and Dwayne, why don't you talk about your background and, and uh, history with this subject? And you have um, something pretty interesting to share with us as you speak, uh, a series of images. Hi. Um, yeah, are we ready with the images? Hmm. Here we go. Okay, um, yeah, to talk about coyote for me, I have to go back to 1990. Um, it seems like, yeah, yeah, coyote begins in 1990 for me, um, just like it was for Jonathan. Um, because uh, I was out on the Cape as an artist residency in Provincetown called the Fine Arts Work Center. And uh, it's a seven month residency for uh, emerging artists. And my um, arrival to Provincetown coincided with the arrival of coyotes to the Cape. And um, um, one of the things that had happened when I was out there, uh, another thing that was going on was uh, the Columbus Quincentennial was coming, uh, the 500th anniversary of Columbus's quote discovery of America. And um, at the time, um, you know, everybody was getting ready for the uh, for the anniversary. Um, it was the period of um, historical revision and multiculturalism, um, mainly in the academic settings. And uh, what had happened was um, the locals in Provincetown discovered there was an indigenous artist in the residency at the Fine Arts Work Center, who happened to be me. And uh, so they, you know, they were asking me to um, meet their uh, public, you know, K through 12 students in some capacity with a minor stipend, <laughs> which I desperately needed at the time. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, I was trying to figure out how to communicate um, indigenous culture to first graders, um, you know, seven, eight, nine year old kids. Um, and um, without maybe, you know, going into too many of the really hardcore facts and things that had happened, um, there was one moment when I was meeting some of the children when a, a young boy, probably around seven, was tapping my leg and he was very upset. He said, uh, is it true that we killed all the Indians? And, um, you know, it was at that time I was trying to figure out another way to kind of approach these kids. So what I did was um, while I was in, the, in this residency, um, you know, which I'll talk a little bit more about, but uh, I came up with this idea um, after seeing, you know, um, some sand animations. Um, what I did was I adapted a story um, 
using sand uh, for these school children. Um, and I was, you know, adapting a few other kinds of you know, traditional stories I had found written, or they were from um, uh, poetry by contemporary indigenous artists like Peter Blue Cloud. Um, and so this story is called um, Coyote and the Dog Society. And let's go to the next slide. So it starts out, you know, me drawing on this on this cloth. It says, Coyote asked, and he was denied. A long time ago, there was a group of dogs who called themselves the Dog Society. Every so often, the dogs would gather to do a communal activity called a sweat. The sweat is held in a small dome-shaped structure and has a set of is a set of hot stones in the center where the participants pour water <clears throat> over the stones to produce steam. Um, during this gathering, the participants sing and pray, and often they are allowed to dream. Can we go to the next slide? Oh, next slide. <laughs> Sorry. Yep, I okay. can. There's the dog is dreaming. Um, Coyote noted that the dogs, wait, wait, wait. Okay. Coyote noted that the dogs often remove their dog suits before entering the sweat lodge structure. So one day as the dogs were preparing to gather, um, well, not, I'm sorry. It's been like 20 years since I've done this. Um, just one day. Okay. We'll say one day, um, Coyote noticed that the dogs were, get, were, were gathering. And so Coyote came to them and he asked, but he was denied. Coyote asked the dogs if he could join them in their gathering to share in their songs and prayers. But the dog society was shocked. They said, we cannot allow Coyote um, to participate in our gathering because Coyote has fleas. We go to the next slide. So I got a skateboarder out right outside my window here. Um, coyote has fleas. We cannot allow coyote into our sweat lodge. Next slide. Because coyote is unclean. We cannot allow coyote into our sweat lodge. Next slide because coyote is uncultured. And then they said, and we cannot absolutely allow a coyote into our sweat lodge. Next slide, because coyote is not a dog at all. Okay, next slide. So coyote left immediately. Their comments were rude and offensive. And in those days, just like these days, it is wrong for any creature to deny help to those who ask for it. So Coyote waited in the hills for the dogs to enter their sweat lodge. Let's go to the next slide. The dogs unzipped their um, dog suits and they entered their lodge. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> Coyote then came down. Oops, let's go back to the last one, sorry. I think I, I think I dropped a slide. Oh, okay, yeah, leave it there. Coyote then came down the hill and threw all the dog suits into a big pile. And then with muddy paws, he stomped on their dog suits, rendering every suit unrecognizable. He then set fire to the sweat lodge and he yelled into the, um, into the dog's lodge. He said, hey, dogs, he said, someone has set fire to your sweat lodge. And now they're setting fire to your dog suits. Save what you can before it's too late. And all the dogs rushed out into the cold January air, dog naked and freezing. Those animals jumped into the first dog suits they could get their paws on. And Coyote, using his first powers, made the dog suits zippers disappear, trapping each dog in someone else's coat. Next slide.
Okay, let's go to the next one. I'm hoping I did this right. Okay, I did it right. So today we see Coyote. He's off in the hills grinning and laughing at those dogs. And he's, um, because today when two dogs meet, the first thing they do is they smell and sniff each other's butts because they're looking for their original coat. And Coyote, then again, sorry, is off in the hills grinning and laughing. Next slide. And he's thinking to himself, how wonderful it is to be uncultured. Next slide. Oh, next slide, please. Sorry. How wonderful it is to be uncultured. Next slide. How wonderful it is to be unclean. Next slide. Is that it? Um, how great it is, he thinks, um, to have fleas because I love each and every one of my fleas. Next slide. And how great it is and all the better for me to not be a dog at all. Then we go to the next slide. But how great it is to be coyote. And that's the end of the story. So, you know, that story, I mean, um, the, the title of your exhibition takes the form of the title of a typical uh, coyote story. And yeah. in typical coyote stories, the, the coyote is um, an outsider quite often, but also the winner at the end. There's, there's a combination of things uh, going on here. Um, I think it is fascinating that you actually uh, started working with the coyote at the same time that Dr. Wei started studying the coyote in Massachusetts. And uh, I got a question uh, for, for Dr. Uh, Wei. Um, just the a brief overview of, of the ecology and biology of this animal and particularly its survival and how it made it finally far eastern into the far eastern parts of the United States. Yeah, it's a great point and it kind of grounds this animal and, and, and what it is in, in, in its background. Um, I guess kind of in a nutshell, the animal is native to a good amount of North America. Uh, for the most part, we think they're native to or originally from most of the Midwest all the way to the West Coast. So the eastern kind of deciduous forest where we are now um, seems to be the one place where they originally were not uh, native to. But they had a, a pretty big range. The, the prairies certainly people associate them with and the deserts from Wiley Coyote and the Roadrunner. But they lived all the way over to the West Coast of California historically. And it's believed that historically we had this very coyote-like wolf native to the eastern United States called the Eastern or the Red Wolf. Um, and people debate if they're the same or a different species, but clearly they're kind of a, a coyote-like wolf. And it's believed that both the coyote, the Eastern Wolf, and the Red Wolf, all three of them, or, or two of them, if you, if, you, if you merge the Eastern and the Red Wolf, evolved in North America. And then you have the larger gray wolf that most likely evolved in Eurasia and came over the Bering Land Bridge 10 to 12, 10 to 12,000 years ago when the first humans, the indigenous humans came. We now, of course, call them Native Americans. Uh, when they came over, um, we think that's when gray wolves really colonized a lot of, of North America. And people associate wolves as the gray wolf, but a lot of people don't associate wolves with the eastern or the red wolf, which is most likely native to this area. And so the coyote had, has, had lived here historically for thousands upon thousands of years, well before the first human came. And then of course, um, as humans came of, of all different backgrounds, uh, coyotes were here and continue to be here. Um, but what's curious about the coyote is we don't think that they originally lived in the Eastern United States until uh, drastic habitat change and predator arrangements change and mainly Europeans arriving seems to have created this void because Europeans greatly changed the habitat 
and the landscape of the eastern United States. And they also er eradicated most of the native predators, which were mainly cougars and, uh, and wolves from the east. The interesting kind of background with the, the, the coyote colonies in the east, where, where of course everybody knows they now live, is they seem to have mated with the remaining Eastern and Red Wolves as they made this colonization kind of complete of most of North America. And so the Eastern coyotes that live here in the Northeast have both Western coyote, of course, but also um, genetics in, in up to about 25 to 30% of their DNA from wolf-like creatures, especially the Eastern and the Red Wolf. And, and so when people hear the word coy wolf, it just simply is the Eastern coyote with, with a second name because we now know the animals that were originally here were, were wolves, and now we have this kind of coyote-wolf hybrid that is now here. So coyotes have always been native to most of North America, North America, except for the far north in the eastern, eastern uh, North America that I just referenced. And so they have a neat and interesting background because a lot of Native American tribes and early Europeans call them tricksters in one form or another, which, um, we can expand upon, uh, but the, the kind of the trick is, is not only can we not get rid of these animals, but they're actually increasing their range greatly as other uh, native predators have decreased their range in the past 100 to 200 years. Um, we've been joined um, by Dr. Baldy. Uh, Dr. Baldy, um, can you talk a little bit about your, your interest and background in the subject of the coyote? Sure. Thanks, everyone. I'm sorry that I was a little bit late. Uh, everything that went wrong could go wrong in getting on the Zoom today. Um, but I finally made it work, I hope. Uh, so, hey, young Kilet, Dr. Kutcher Rizling Baldi Ahoyet. I am Dr. Kutcher Rizling Baldi. I'm the um, Department Chair of Native American Studies at Cal Poly Humboldt in far Northern California. I'm also Hoopa Yurik and Karuk and enrolled in the Hoopa Valley Tribe, all three tribes from very far Northern California, located very near each other. Um, and my work with coyote has been a lifetime of uh, hearing coyote stories from my ancestors and tribal peoples. Um, my mom, one of her favorite things was to tell us coyote stories growing up uh, and really always making them very contextual to our current experience. I remember a, a story about coyote dancing with the stars also involved coyote really wanting like a Big Mac uh, while he was up with the stars and thinking about the way that she taught us about indigenous storytelling through just our everyday lives uh, and the things we could learn. Um, I'll also say that I've done a, a lot of work with Coyote as literary figure and Coyote as a philosophy and as a philosopher scholar. Um, I think that our indigenous ways of knowing this place are very, very old. Uh, we have a place-based knowledge that is thousands upon thousands of years of observation and experimentation uh, and understanding how you live with the place that you are in. Um, and then thinking about what we call our more than human relatives. So we don't, we don't think of them as something like subhuman. We think of them as more than human and the ways in which we honor and respect our more than human relatives through story. Um, in the Hoopa context, and what we say is that, you know, prior to this world that we live in right now, was the time of animals. And then prior to that was a time that we call the time of the Kehenai or our first people. Um, they were supposed to be uh, sort of like very, very strong figures. They were very tall. They were like eight, 10 feet tall. Uh, they had very long eyelashes that were bright red um, and went over their heads. And they, they were the ones that put the world into place for us. And they left behind the instructions of how we're supposed to live here so that we can always have a good home and a good earth. Uh, and those are the things that we still do to this day. And after they decided that their time was done and it was time for humans, um, they, they went into thing, the things around us. And so they go into the rocks and the rivers and the trees and they go into the animals. And so the coyote that we know today, which uh, is sort of, you know, like animal figure, Canis Latrans, um, that is the, the embodiment of our first person. The coyote first person went into them uh, and lives within them. And so we care for animals as our spirit peoples, as our peoples that have put this place into, into balance for us. So we have to also care for them and be the people that 
put the, that keep the place in balance for them as they did for us. And I feel like Coyote has always played a very significant role in our child, from our childhood up until this day to help us understand um, the complexity of what it means to build a world and to like keep a world in balance uh, because Coyote is a figure that makes mistakes, um, makes decisions just based on being, you know, hungry at the time or uh, just based on being sad about something or being mad at somebody. Uh, and we get to see what that means for us when we think about how we are, wanna build a good world too. Uh, and I think Coyote has always been that figure for us. Um, I love talking about Coyote. I think that uh, one of my favorite quotes about him comes from a book um, where the anthropologist is out interviewing like many native people uh, about Coyote and says like, I want to talk about, I want to talk to you about Coyote, you know, like Coyote, the animal figure, Coyote, the real figure and Coyote, the imaginary figure. And he says, what makes you think Coyote is an imaginary figure? Uh, he's not imaginary, he's real. And, and then to think about what that means. So I love, um, I love talking about that. And I have many, many Coyote stories that have uh, been a part of my life from the time that I was very, very small. Thank you. Um, one thing I think um, the audience should should note, and this is something I think is really significant to the exhibition, is Duane uh, has used as source material for the image of the coyote in his work, uh, Mexican folk art coyote masks. And I just thought, I think it's really important that Duane, that you talk about this, this decision, which adds, I think, like a level of complexity and meaning to your work. Um, and also, you know, needless to say, the role of the mask in storytelling in general, not just in indigenous cultures, but why, um, why, why um, the Mexican folk art masks? Okay, well, let's see. Um, the coyote image in the uh, 1411 by paintings and prints from the show. Um, those images themselves are made from multiple cast shadows of the masks. There's only two of them. Um, uh, one, one whose shadow loans itself more to the form of an artifact or skull. And the other one takes on personality. So it becomes more about portraiture. But uh, um, the shadows of the coyote um, of each mask are layered to top of each other to create what I called a, a, a dual attention span. So you can see one, but you cannot see the other um, because when you're seeing both of them, they're constantly moving. Um, and um, kind of to get there, I, you know, I started in 1996 when I transitioned from doing presentations and some storytelling to uh, solely painting. I was doing monochromatic white on white acrylic paintings. And the format of the, pr the painting was problematic because it seemed to take the uh, proximity um, of the storyteller to the audience out of the equation. Um, so to address that, I began using my own shadow on, in these white on white paintings and very soon began to use the mask itself um, the, the masks themselves, um, um, as folk art objects were required in, uh, the, in San Miguel de Allende and I think is it Guanajuato, Mexico. And, uh, I was attracted to folk art because of its connection to the handmade and to mythology. Um, but I'm also suspicious of the market effect on these same objects. My fear is that the market shops and appropriates its favorite artifacts to the exclusion of other facts and other contexts. So the use of the Mexican folk art mask, its shadow, the use of its shadow um, was an attempt to kind of transcend its objectness and return some sense of agency to that object. Um, hence it's wide range, you know, there's 46 of them in the show um, it's a wide range of emotion and mutability. And of course, you, the way you've uh, superimposed the images, it, as you suggested, implies motion. There's a motion, which once again, talks a little bit about narrative, getting back to storytelling and how in a, in a painting, which is, you know, can't have a narrative structure, how you could tell a story with one image. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was interested in the idea of um, using the shadow to return some form of agency to the object. Um, Dr. Way, in his research, he describes a coyote that live in New England as coy wolves due to the interbreeding with, uh, between the two species. Um, it seems generally there are radically different views of uh, coyotes, uh, Canis lantrans, and wolves, Canis lupus, um, with wolves being considered somehow more noble than their smaller cousins. How do these views affect the work that each of you are engaged in? Because both of these animals are looked at quite differently. Um, Dr. Wei? Yeah, that's a great question and a great point. And, and I must point out that where wolves actually live, um, there are a lot of segments of people that don't appreciate them as much, kind of like coyotes in a way. But I think overall, it's a pretty good summary that um, coyotes are generally viewed upon as common pests, vermin, some, you know, words I don't particularly like, but they're often Flea, called that. I, I don't as as, as uh, Dwayne related, flea ridden. Flea ridden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, uh, trickster, which gets both into the European viewpoint of them and then um, the indigenous viewpoint that Dr. Baldy might expand upon. But um, yeah, I think it's, it's a pretty good summary. And, and I think a lot of it has to do with their commonality. The fact that they live all over and they have run-ins with people, even though the run-ins are much, much less than would be expected based upon where they live, since they live basically everywhere in North America. Um, and then wolves are kind of seen as these noble animals, as, as you suggest, because they're because they're for the most part endangered until recently until the last 10 to 20 years they were pretty much endangered throughout the country and now they're going back and forth on the endangered species list um and so people see them as kind of these mythical animals that um are noble because they're not really known about them they don't live around here they're they're not near where we live and of course now that they live in many places like idaho montana in Wyoming, they're not treated much differently than coyotes in those areas, and they're treated pretty poorly in terms of the uh, seasons that are allowed and the things that are allowed to be done on them. So I think it has a lot to do with the animal's um, ability to survive around people and to be regarded as pests overall. And, and I don't regard them as that. I don't appreciate those terms because I think they're really important spiritually, culturally, and ecologically but I think that their commonality leads to a lot of those perceptions of them. And fortunately, a lot of those perceptions are changing with many different cultures. Even the European culture is starting to appreciate them more. There's many, many groups and many, many people that are trying to protect them more. And that usually doesn't happen when an animal becomes more common, they usually don't get more protections, but um, they slowly are getting more protections even as they stay common. So I think people are starting to appreciate them for what indigenous people have always appreciated them for, there's more cultures that are finally appreciating them for what they are. They're successful, important, and culturally important, as well as ecologically important animal. But it's taken a while to get there. And I think that overall perception that you state um, is kind of an accurate one. I mean, Europeans, there were wolves in Europe. So Europeans came over and had experience with them and didn't like them. And so I guess it was a confusion when they came over of thinking that the coyote was just some sort of wolf, a smaller wolf, correct? Yeah, and they're, and they're both incredibly close related. Coyotes, wolves, and of course, the eastern or the red wolf is right in between them. They're all about as close related as species can get. And we know that the eastern, the red, and the coyote are so eastern wolf and red wolf and the coyote are so close related they can hybridize with each other and the and the eastern wolf is so close related to the gray wolf they can hybridize with each other so there aren't many species that can mate with each other um the last time humans could do that was when neanderthals lived in europe and um in asia um but we don't have a species close enough but those guys are really closely related to each other so essentially coyotes are also called prairie wolves and brush wolves because they're very closely related. But yeah, Europeans did um, live with the gray wolf, the, 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 the wolf that most people think of when they hear the word wolf in North America, the, the larger wolf. Um, Europeans did live with them historically as well because they lived throughout the uh, Northern Hemisphere from, from Europe to Asia, and as well as North America. Dr. Boley, what what's the difference in status and attributes of the coyote and wolves in indigenous culture? 
mean, I mean, I think what I find kind of interesting is, um, I, I think there's like a, a great affection for Coyote, uh, and and even, I mean, even in that affection, referring to him sometimes as a like a kind of dirty uh, individual, someone who spends a lot of time like being messy, um, someone who has a disorganized kind of life, uh, and even an approach to life that is a little bit um, chaotic, uh, but also in in their chaos means very well and does so many amazing things. Uh, one of our key stories about Coyote is that during a time when the world was very dark and cold, um, we as people were suffering because we didn't have a fire and we didn't have the things we needed to take care of ourselves. And um, we had a certain group of our first people that were hoarding fire away from humans. And Coyote was the only one with enough uh, gravitas to sort of say, well, let's go get the fire from them and bring them to humans. Everybody else was like, oh no, that would be very dangerous or something bad might happen or we might not be able to do it. And he was like, eh, who cares? Like, let's try it, see what happens. And and what if we do get hurt? Because his sort of very nature of being kind of chaotic um, and not like thinking everything through all the time was necessary to be the person willing to take that chance to make a difference. And so he runs up the hill and he's the first person to grab this uh, little coal of fire from the people that are hoarding it, from the, the people who would keep it from human beings. And then he runs it down the hill and he convinces the rest of the um, animals to pass it along so that they can make it go. It's the, like a relay race of fire to get to human beings. So I think part of our understanding of him is, is, is within his very nature, of course, he might be a little bit hard to deal with, or he might smell, or he might kind of make your house really messy, or he might take something like you might be raising chickens and he'll take one, but it's part of his, uh, like almost his charm in a way. And our affection for that is even demonstrated in our languages. The Karuk people, um, when they refer to him in story, they call him Pinefich. Uh, and and he, that's that's Coyote, the, the, the person, Coyote, the storyteller, Coyote, the philosopher, Coyote, the hero, that's Pinefich. But what it actually means in Karuk is shitty old man. Um, and so to be like, there's like an affection there though, in that it's not an insult to him. It's like, it's talking about him in this very affectionate way. I, I love that about us as indigenous peoples in how we see that um, there's also a benefit to people's being a little bit out thinking a lot, like a little bit outside of the box sometimes or being willing to take big chances or, or telling us that it's okay to like, push ourselves. Um, and I love that we, alongside all the ways we talk about Coyote, there's always kind of an affection behind that, that I think we have in most of the stories that we tell. Um, and we think about our first people in a very kind of affectionate way. It, it sounds like what you're describing is, uh, he's the original anti-hero. Kind of that. And he's also yeah. like, um, he's like your friend that'll tell you to chill out when you're all stressed out and be like, why are you so stressed out? And you're like, because I'm an there's actually a story about him where he goes to one of his friends and he's like, why are you so stressed out right now? And he's like, I'm supposed to put the stars in the sky. I've been given the most important job. I have to put the stars in the sky. And he's taking the time to like place them one by one. And Coyote goes, if you do that, like that way, you will spend the rest of your life placing the stars in the sky and we won't be able to go out and have any fun. So like, stop doing that. And he's like, no, I have to be very meticulous. And Coyote goes, do you? And then he grabs the basket and he just throws them all up in the sky. And he's like, look, now we're done. Let's go, let's go to dinner. Um, and there's something really cool about having somebody in your life that'll be like, it's gonna be fine. And, and now we all love the stars in the sky, like the way that they are. Um, and we, we placed some of them into very particular constellations, but the rest are almost kind of random and, and it's okay. And I, I think that that kind of um, way of thinking about how the world is supposed to work is important for us to be able to navigate what resilience actually looks like. It takes a lot of humor. Uh, it takes a lot of like uh, teasing. It takes a lot of, it takes somebody to tell you that it's gonna be all right and somebody to take that chance. I think Coyote's always willing to take that chance for people, which is what we need. Uh, Dwayne, you, you're cl clearly your work is, is reinventing and continuing this tradition, reinventing this tradition in the 21st century. Uh, I'm curious about what your family, um, not all of your family is, uh, thoroughly engaged in Native culture, but what does your family think of your work? Like what, what meanings do they read into it? 
you're 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 muted, Dwayne. Sorry, I was chuckling. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I know that that's a, when you ask any artist what their what their family thinks of their work, you're going to get uh, kind of strong reactions. But in the case of uh, your work with the coyote, I'm just curious. Um, no, everybody is very supportive of what I'm doing. Um, you know, for you know, I'm one of those first generation college kids. Um, and um, um, nobody tried to tell me what I, you know, not to go into art, you know, that type of thing. They, they said, you, you know, you do what you need to do, get your education um, and, you know, give back. Um, and um, they just, you know, in some ways it's like, yeah, you know, they, they liked it, I mean, but um, mainly they're just talking maybe about my role as a, as, as a role model to, to younger Native kids. Um, so w one thing is I knew very little about this subject before working with Duane on this exhibition, just a very superficial view, the usual trickster view of the coyote um, that you know get, garnered through popular culture. And uh, I learned a lot, but I'm curious, what each of you have learned personally about yourselves, maybe about the world through the coyote. And we'll start with Jock, Dr. Way. What have, what have you learned? Not just Great about question. the coyote, but, but about your place in nature perhaps and uh, your relationship with this animal or relationship with the world. Has a coyote taught you something? <laughs> Uh, Dr. Baldy said, "Kind of, I, I liked her. Uh, you know, the indigenous uh, relationships with them is, has always intrigued me, kind of from the outside. And um, I think there's a lot of good lessons there that even you know different cultures and scientists and and and, and lots of different folks can can take in because obviously these animals, no matter what we've done to them, no matter what cultures have done to them, is." incredibly has been inc incredibly successful has been incredibly resilient and um, bounces back from just about anything we do to it good or bad um, unfortunately with Europeans it's a lot of bad uh, and they have done really well and they they're really successful and my kind of view from a scientist has shown how that's the case and I you know won't get too far into that but their reproductive capabilities, their um, sociality, but their ability to disperse and colonize to new areas is kind of explaining a lot of why they're successful. But I, I just think that um, they, they've, they teach you how you can be successful, how one can be successful, and um, that uh, no matter kind of what nature throws at them to be adaptable and to be able to kind of go with the punches is, is all their calling card. And that's, I think, why they're so wildly um, perceived by different people in, in different cultures as um, so many different caricatures because I think because of their ability to live and thrive and sur survive near around us and, and all over the place has kind of been kind of a model that humans either appreciate or maybe are jealous of. Um, and uh, they certainly are an animal that has learned that uh, no matter what, uh, it's, it's learn how to take their punches and, and learn how to be successful given the cards that they're dealt with depending on where we might be. And obviously the, the survival of the coyote, you could draw an analogy with them and the, the survival of indigenous culture and indigenous peoples of, of the coyote being hunted to near extinction or attempt an attempt to kill the coyote off and the fact that it survived and the, the uh, European uh, displacement and genocide of native people. And despite, despite uh, best efforts um, of indigenous culture living and seeming to, uh, to I don't wanna say come back, but to, to, um, to exist in, and grow in the 21st century. Dwayne, what, what, have, what have you learned? I mean, what have you learned from a coyote? Um, well, I like what Dr. Baldy Describing is the idea of resilience um, and resolve. Um, because, uh, you know, I started working from the coyote 
as a result of that exhibition called the Submolic Show, which was Columbus spelled backwards. Um, I was invited to be in that show back in 1992. And um, the, um, uh, they were asking, it was my, my mentor, Jean Quixesi Smith, was asking for overtly political work. And um, um, I was too much maybe a low key guy, but also an oil painter, landscape based oil painter. And um, um, the kind of specificity that that's called for was something that I had to kind of uh, work from. And it was Coyote, I think, who uh, in the reading about Coyote, talking to my parents, um, that was kind of, you know, personally, it helped me to, to, to kind of embrace and to understand um, the overtly political or the subtle and the subtly political. You, you've described that you, at one point, you let the coyote make the work. Yeah, that was part of it was to, uh, you know, you know, if I can't do it, I want to see what, you know, ask coyote to give a, give it a shot as well. And Dr. Boldy, what, what have you learned personally from your engagement with the coyote? I mean, I, I think Coyote has really reminded me that, you know, our stories are much more than a mythology. They're much more than a fable. They are a philosophy and they're scientific knowledge. They are a history. Um, they're a way for us to engage in learning. Uh, they've done lots of studies which have shown that we've, we learn far more through stories than we do through reading like bullet points on a piece of paper and trying to memorize them. We remember things when we learn it through story, when we tell a story about it. Uh, and so our way of passing on knowledge was very important to us. And that knowledge has stood the test of time. And Coyote for me is much more than uh, like a tale, like a tall tale with a lesson behind it. It's, it's an understanding philosophically of like how the world can work and the things that we as human beings can learn uh, if we really are open our mind up to listening. And the thing I love about coyote stories and I love about coyote knowledge is that you'll never get the same thing uh, at the same, like you'll never get the same thing every time you learn something from coyote. Because every time you hear something or you encounter one or you see what's happening in like a coyote's life, uh, you see something new about that. And, what our elders always told us was, we would say, what's the point of that story? And they'd go, I don't know. What's the point of the story to you? Because what you need to get out of it right now is what you're going to get out of it. And you'll get something else out of it later. And every time you'll learn something that you're supposed to learn from this. And that's how they teach us is they, they allow us the space to sort of make mistakes and learn like human beings. And Coyote for me, is probably one of the greatest philosophers um, when we talk about who's thinking about what the world is supposed to be like. Uh, Coyote's building a philosophy of the world for us to be able to navigate and see like, how can we make the world a better balanced place? And he's so inspirational. I think when we look at the artwork uh, that's featured in this exhibit, what you see is there's no, Coyote is, there's, there's no one way to interpret exhibit, draw, engage with, because it's supposed to be an, it's supposed to be an art form. Uh, our stories are supposed to inspire like each of us in new and creative and meaningful ways so that we can be the best human beings that we need to be so that we keep this world in balance uh, for all time. Um, we're running out of time here. We have time for maybe a question or two. Um, looking, uh, do we have any questions coming into chat here? It doesn't look like we have any questions at this point, and we're just about at uh, close to seven o'clock. Uh, anyone want to chime in with a question in the audience? Well, um, I want to thank you all, and um, I just wanted everyone to know that uh, the an article on Dwayne and his work appeared in the New York Times today. Um, I'm going to congratulate him on that. Uh, we were hoping uh, for some uh, significant attention 
in the media landscape out there about his show, and uh, it happened today, coincidentally. And also, I'd like to thank uh, Namulin Barisayan, uh, the museum's, the Aldrich's director of education, for actually organizing tonight's panel. Uh, she's been very instrumental in, in gathering this group. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Wei. Thank you, Duane. And thank you, Dr. Baldy. And um, as uh, the slides indicate, there's a, we did a, a really significant publication on Duane's work, uh, which is available uh, through the museum's website or uh, on site if you happen to come to the museum. The, 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 the exhibition is still on view uh, up until uh, the beginning of May. Thank you all. <laughs>